My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to do a video on the subject of atrial fibrillation. And in particular, I wanted to talk about atrial fibrillation in those patients who also have chronic kidney disease. This is particularly relevant because atrial fibrillation and chronic kidney disease share the same risk factors. When you have chronic kidney disease, you're more likely to have atrial fibrillation. When you have atrial fibrillation, it is more likely to make the kidneys worse. And the risk of bad things happening, such as the risk of strokes, is substantially higher in that subgroup of patients who have both AF and chronic kidney disease. More so, the management of these patients is particularly difficult. So let me try and talk you through what we do know about atrial fibrillation and chronic kidney disease. So the first thing I would say is that all the risk factors for heart disease, which increase the likelihood of atrial fibrillation developing, will also increase the risk of chronic kidney disease happening. So patients with high blood pressure are more likely to have AF, Patients with high blood pressure are more likely to develop chronic kidney disease. Patients with diabetes, same thing. Patients with severe obesity, patients with sleep apnea, same thing. So they tend to share the same risk factors. It's also worth noting that chronic kidney disease is a major problem. It is estimated that the number of patients with chronic kidney disease is now doubling every decade. One of the big problems with chronic kidney disease is that most people rely on a blood test called creatinine to make the diagnosis. So if you go to your GP, they will check your creatinine levels in the blood, and if your creatinine levels are okay, they're not perturbed. What we do realize, however, is that creatinine is not a very reliable early indicator of chronic kidney disease. In fact, people say that by the time the creatinine actually goes up, the renal function may have gone down by up to 50%. So it's not a very good test to pick up those patients who are developing chronic kidney disease at their early stages. The other problem with uh, creatinine is that it is dependent on muscle bulk as well as diet. By that, what I mean is that if you have a big muscular guy, then their creatinine may be, you know, the same as may, maybe with the normal limits. The normal limits don't change according to age. So if you're a little woman who has, you know, lost a lot of muscle mass and you have the same creatinine, your GP will think that the creatinine tells you that the kidneys are okay. But in the woman who doesn't have much muscle mass, the creatinine would be expected to be much lower if it were normal. The fact that her creatinine levels are high and comparable to those of a muscular big young guy tells you how unreliable the creatinine test is because the normal ranges don't make a distinction for body mass, for age, etc. So the problem is that people can be developing chronic kidney disease because they have diabetes, high blood pressure, it may not get picked up. Similarly, they may also develop atrial fibrillation, some of which may be silent, and that may not get picked up. But the combination of the two can be really, really dangerous. Anyway, it's also important to say that chronic kidney disease by itself is a very inflammatory condition, and anyone with chronic kidney disease is more likely to develop virtually all forms of heart disease. Now, let's talk about what we know about AF and then what we know about AF and chronic kidney disease. The first thing to say is that the general prevalence of AF in the population as a whole is 1 to 2 percent. So uh, if you go out into town, 100 people, 1 to 2 of them, if you monitor them long enough, will have some AF. If you then just pick up those patients of the population who are above the age of 80, the prevalence of AF goes up to 12 percent. So 12 out of every 180 year olds you'll meet will probably have AF. What is really interesting is if you look at patients with chronic kidney disease, and particularly those patients who are requiring dialysis, and you then look for AF in those patients, the prevalence of AF is 13 to 27 percent, meaning AF is 10 to 20 times more prevalent in dialysis patients. And this may also still be an underestimate because AF can be silent. So 
a person may be having AF but may know nothing about it and therefore the AF may not necessarily be picked up. When AF is found, it correlates very strongly with underlying heart disease in patients with kidney disease. Virtually all forms of heart disease are uh, more common, so patients with kidney disease and AF are more likely to have coronary disease. Patients with AF and chronic kidney disease are more likely to have heart failure. Patients with AF and chronic kidney disease are more likely to have valve disease. Patients with AF and chronic kidney disease are more likely to have left ventricular heart, uh, hypertrophy, which basically means that the heart is uh, stiff and very muscular and stiff and doesn't relax as well. And that can be a precursor to developing heart failure. Now, what we also know is that when people develop AF, it actually makes their kidney disease worse because when a person develops AF, the heart doesn't pump as effectively, which means that the kidneys get less blood. This is a simplistic explanation, but in patients, the de in patients with kidney disease, the development of AF will make the kidney disease worse. What we also know is that if you take those patients who have kidney disease and AF and you compare them to those patients who have the same magnitude of kidney disease but no AF, the mortality in the group of patients who have kidney disease and AF is double the mortality of patients with the same magnitude of kidney disease but no AF. So the mortality in patients who have kidney disease without AF may be something like 2% per year. If you then add in AF, the mortality goes up to 5% per year. Again, what is the big problem with AF? The big problem is that where you have AF, uh, there is a higher risk of strokes. But the same also applies with kidney disease. If you have kidney disease by itself, your risk of stroke goes up. If you then combine the two, the AF and the kidney disease, the risk of strokes can go up from 1.6 fold to 4.6 fold, so substantially goes up, depending on which study you read. Now, when we find a patient with AF, the first thing we want to do is we want to work out what their risk of strokes is going to be, and if the risk of strokes is construed to be high, then we start them on anticoagulants, blood thinning medications. Unfortunately, at this point in time, chronic kidney disease does not count as a risk factor in most of the scoring uh, mechanisms for stroke uh, risk assessment. So at the moment, we use this thing called the chads 2 vasque score, okay, which says, okay, you get a point for advanced age, you get a point for diabetes, you get a point for high blood pressure, you get a point for um, heart failure, you get a point for vascular disease, and you get a point for, or two points for previous stroke. It does not count chronic kidney disease, although most people now are beginning to realize that chronic kidney disease does substantially increase the risk of strokes. But our risk stratification tools are probably outdated and they don't take this into account. So if you have chronic kidney disease, you're at a higher risk of strokes, but if you didn't have any of the other risk factors that would fit in the chad 2 vasque score, you may not be anticoagulated, which means that you may be at a higher risk, which is not adequately covered. And it's just worth you knowing that. Of course, anticoagulation isn't without risk. When you start a person on anticoagulation, the risk is of bleeding. You may increase the risk of bleeding. Now, the problem in patients with chronic kidney disease is that by very definition, if you have chronic kidney disease, you have disordered platelet function and you're more likely to bleed anyway. If you then add in an anticoagulant, then that can increase your risk of bleeding even further. That's one problem. The second problem is some of the medications we use for anticoagulation are excreted by the kidneys. So if the kidney function is worse, then there is a risk that those medications could build up in the system. In particular, this applies to the NOACs, the new agents which thin the blood, which, requ which don't require the blood test. They're called the NOACs or the DOACs. Most of the NOACs and the DOACs are excreted by the kidneys. And if the kidney function is really, really bad, then it is recommended that these are not used 
because they can increase the risk of bleeding in those patients. Warfarin, the common traditional anticoagulant, can still be used. But again, it isn't without hazard because the risk can again be increased because these patients are at a higher risk of bleeding anyway because their platelets aren't working as well. So patients with chronic kidney disease and AF sometimes find themselves uh, in a situation which could be likened to being stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. Okay, They have a condition that substantially increases the risk of strokes, but they're also at a much higher risk of bleeding. And therefore, in that setting, it's very difficult to know exactly what to do. And this is where I think individualized risk stratification comes in. And basically what I do and what I think should be done is that the GP, the patient's kidney specialist, the patient's heart specialist, and the patient themselves need to sit down and go through things and try and work out whether the risk from anticoagulating the patient is likely to be greater than the benefits. If the person is actively bleeding or has had a major bleed in the past, then obviously you have to accept the increased risk of strokes. You don't want to make them worse by introducing an anticoagulant. On the other hand, if the patient is otherwise well, they don't have any major bleeding tendencies, etc., then I think it's very reasonable to start that patient on an anticoagulant. Most times, it is generally felt that the benefits from anticoagulation usually tend to outweigh the risks. All right. Now, when an anticoagulant is prescribed, it is important to take certain precautions. The first thing is, I think in general, if a NOAC or a DOAC is prescribed, you may have to reduce the dose appropriately. And where warfarin is prescribed, it becomes important that patients have regular blood tests to check whether their clotting levels are okay, and also to make sure that the kidneys are okay and they're not deteriorating, because if the kidneys deteriorated, it may have an impact. Now, it is also very important for patients to uh, minimize taking other medications that could thin the blood. These include things like non-steroidals, minimizing alcohol intake, and ensuring that patients tend to be compliant with their medications and they don't miss doses or take too much, etc. Another thing that's really important is where there is chronic kidney disease, there's usually high blood pressure. And again, if you have high blood pressure, that can increase your risk of bleeding. So it becomes really important that the blood pressure is adequately, aggressively controlled. So in summary, what I'd like to say is that chronic kidney disease is bad news. And the best thing we can do is to avoid getting into it in the first place, and this is through good lifestyle measures, good risk factor control, controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, etc. I think in those people who do have high blood pressure and diabetes, etc., it is important that the GP doesn't just rely on the creatinine measurement to look for evidence of kidney disease. More importantly, I think it's better to look for something called the creatinine clearance and calculating something called the glomerular filtration rate, GFR. Okay, in patients who do have established kidney disease, I think it is important to aggressively look for the presence of atrial fibrillation because it will change how you treat that patient. As I say, some AF may be silent. Just doing an ECG or doing a 24-hour monitor to look for AF is probably not enough. Most patients require either 30 days of monitoring or even longer monitoring to look for evidence of silent atrial fibrillation. When atrial fibrillation is found, these patients should be referred for a full evaluation of the heart under the auspices of a cardiologist. And in particular, you want to scan their heart, make sure that the heart is strong, uh, and also potentially look for evidence of coronary disease. Okay. And when AF is found, it is very important for doctors to all get together with the patient and discuss anticoagulation uh, after measured discussion between all the uh, teams that are involved.